Good morning and welcome to the fifth annual Excess Soil Symposium. My name is Corrine Lenz and I'm the content director here at Actual Media. We have an interesting program lined up for you today. Lots of comprehensive conversations with key stakeholders across the industry. We're gonna be covering new developments, including perspectives on land use planning, building issues, environmental impacts, and disposal costs related to new regulations. And this year, for the very first time, the Excess Soil Symposium will cross provincial borders and provide a national perspective on excess soils regulation. Regulations. Before we kick our keynote presentation off, I'm gonna give you a quick tour of the Whova platform, which is this virtual platform we're meeting on today. It's easy to use, and with a few quick pointers, you won't miss out on any key information or networking opportunities. Natasha is gonna work her magic behind the scenes to demonstrate the platform, and I'll talk you through it. All right. And she's ready to go there. Okay, so we'll start with the community board. In there, you'll find several interesting features that'll allow you to connect with other attendees. One of these is the meetups and virtual meets feature. There's already at least one meetup scheduled, but if you would like to suggest another of your own, just all you need to do is drop in the virtual meet information and click post so other attendees will be able to see when it's happening and the information necessary to join. Also within the community board is an article sharing feature. You'll see that several articles have already been added. If you'd like to upload one of your own, all you need to do there is click the article share button at the top right. If you're looking through the community board and don't see a topic that's any of interest to you, no problem, you can create one of your own. At the top left of the board, you'll see a large blue button that says add a topic or social group. Click this and begin your own discussion. I think you'll quickly find you have many kindred spirits online today. Now, beyond the community board, you'll see several other links down the left of your screen. You can learn more about today's speakers, and you also see links to our sponsors' virtual booths. Without them, this event would not be possible. So big thank you to Soil Flow, Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, RCCAO, Stantec, the Cannington Group, TraceNet, Wilms and Shire, WSP, ARIS, Ontario Sewer and Water Main Construction Association, and Parcel Laboratories. All of our sponsors have people standing by, ready to answer questions that you might have, just like a live trade show booth. So please don't be shy to reach out. And the win a prize button is a fun feature. It allows you to participate in our photo contest. Post your favorite excess soils pictures. If you, it could be a picture of your team on the project or on a job, maybe something even a little bit more fun. Who doesn't love digging in the dirt? The photos that get the most likes will be entered into a draw to win a gift card. So be sure to go in there and vote for your favorites. Now, when it's time for you to join one of the sessions that you've signed up for, click the agenda button and select the session. The video stream will appear in the agenda a few minutes before the discussion begins. Once again, we encourage you to connect with your peers today. If you click on the attendee tab, you can not only see who else is attending, but you also have an option of sending them a direct message as well. Simply choose the attendee and click on say hi to privately message them. If you have any questions about the platform, feel free to visit the ask the organizer section in the community board or email our event manager directly at natasha at actualmedia.ca. All right, I'm really eager to get into our keynote presentation, but before I would do that, I'd like to take a few moments to acknowledge the many First Nations and Indigenous peoples of Canada as the original stewards of this great country. I'm here in Toronto, which is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We all share in the responsibility of our natural infrastructure, and there's much we can learn from the traditional knowledge of the land, water, and materials that allow us to build projects that benefit all Canadians. All right, I'm going to hand things over to Andy Manahan from Manahan Consulting Services, and he is going to do us the honor of introducing our keynote speaker. So take it away, Andy. Thank you so much. It uh, gives me great uh, pleasure to uh, make this introduction, but I just wanted to start with um, an overriding theme is that for projects like the one that Megan is going to be talking about, there is a grand vision involved. And I was on the bus about 20 years ago with uh, then Chairman Robert uh, Fung for Waterfront Toronto, um, talking about this transformational project. And um, previously, you know, we had looked at catalytic uh, ways to, to regenerate the port lands from Toronto's bid for the 2008 Olympics and the Pan Am game certainly resulted in some work on the, on the West Don lands. And then a bunch of us were involved a few years ago with a, a bid for Expo 2025 as a way to uh, accelerate these sort of projects. And uh, that didn't work out, but 
the vision remained, and that's the important thing, you know, through um, many symposiums and conferences and seminars, developing excess soil regulations, and that, of course, flowed out of uh, brownfields, um, you know, we've come to this spot. And I think, you know, one thing we probably learned from this is that it has to be an all-hands-on-deck approach, you know, multi-ministry, agency, stakeholder involvement uh, is critical for successful outcomes. And I think you're going to see in this presentation that this is what we're uh, heading towards is a very successful outcome. And uh, of course, many people were um, interested in a circular economy focus. And this has generated commercial opportunities for many, you know, consultants and geoscientists, many others. Um, and in this video, I think you'll see, you know, what has been attracting to some people so far is the new bridges that have been uh, built and installed in the uh, portlands. So um, with respect to our keynote today, um, Megan James is a principal of Geosyntec. She has more than 25 years of experience in risk assessment, remediation, and management of soil, groundwater, and sediment. She readied Waterfront Toronto projects for the excess soil regulation and is currently helping several municipalities get excess soil systems and processes in place. Megan implements soil management based on the ministry's excess soil regulation and has developed soil management plans and soil and sediment reuse specifications that have been used on infrastructure and remediation projects. She's reviewed and guided soil reuse projects totaling 2.3 million cubic meters, ranging in size from uh, small park and road projects with 5,000 uh, meter cube of imported soil to lake filling projects with over 250,000 cubes of soil to river building projects with 1.6 million cubes. Megan's first beneficial soil reuse project was a sports field site in 2006. Several other projects included the Toronto West Donlands project and the audit of 400,000 meter cubes of imported soil in the flood protection landform and the design of a temporary stockpile site in the region of Peel and participation in a roundtable discussion with local regulators from the Netherlands on policies and approaches for soil reuse. Megan has also provided a somewhat humorous uh, tag to her bio. She says that in her spare time, she likes to read the excess soil regulation and soil rules, create excess soil flow charts and talk to people about excess soil. So I'll turn it over now to Aquino. Good morning, excess soil symposium attendees. Welcome to the 2021 excess soil symposium. And thank you actual media for inviting me down to kick off the discussion. And also thank you Andy for the kind introduction. We're going to be heading down to the Toronto Portlands project for a tour. We started prepping soil procedures on this project in 2015. Remember back then, that was before the excess soil regulation and before the proposed regulatory framework, before the drafts. And as the Portlands project evolved, so do the regulations. Let's head down. Okay, here we are at the foot of the Don River where it makes that unnatural 90 degree turn. A century ago, this was solving the flood issues of the day, but a century later, we know a bit more about flooding events and storm systems. The Toronto Region Conservation Authority predicts extensive flooding in this area during a significant storm event. And if memory serves me, in a regulatory event, I'd be in about 0.5 meters of fast flowing water. The Portland's flood protection is a massive undertaking close to the downtown core. Renaturalizing and creating a new river valley through contaminated lands with poor geotechnical quality soil through a bedrock valley is to say the least complicated. The overall cost of the project is $1.25 billion and involves excavating a new one kilometer section of river through former industrial land. Once the flood protection is complete, then the land is unlocked for redevelopment. So let's look at a couple of videos from Waterfront Toronto and a few tweets out on the past and uh, current air photos. We're starting off in August 2019. You can see here the main channel taking shape. This is about three to five months into the excavation up to here. Most of the soil that was excavated was disposed of off site. And the roadways, Cherry Street Commissioners and Dawn Roadway are still active, as well as many of the tenants are still in place on the site. And you can see some of the existing buildings that were later demolished. Cherry Street Lake filling site is just about complete. There hasn't been much activity in many of the other areas. 
Fast forward to August 2021, two years later, you can really see the defined edge of the main channel. The excavation is all complete and the river finishes are being installed. The greenway is mostly complete. There's still some installation here at this point and the north end of the ice management area is also uh, being excavated and processes are underway there. The north plug is installed, the west plug is installed. Those will be removed to connect the channel with the upper Don River. There is some activity here in Promontory Park South and Canoe Cove getting ready for the excavation. Um, and you're also able to see some of the soil management areas and some of the stockpiling uh, getting ready for soil repurposing. This is a drone survey done in August 2021 to give you an overview of the project. We're now traveling west towards the inner harbor of Toronto. You're looking back towards the excavated channel coming into Polson Slip here. This will be the new outlet for the Don River that emerges into the inner harbor. And what we saw back there was the foundations for the Cherry Street Bridge South. Here is the heritage feature of Atlas Crane. This is the dock wall that will be cut down and excavated back here. Excavation is actually underway right now to create Canoe Cove where you'll be able to take kayaks and, and canoes throughout. This is the dock wall on the west edge of this land. There used to be a Marine Terminal 35 building right in this position that has been since removed. We're going further north to look at Cherry Street Lake Filling Project with a new habitat cove that's been created here, the naturalized shoreline along the edging. And then just on our right here is the North Cove where there'll be opportunities for um, launching small craft. We're in the Keating Channel alignment right now and we're traveling towards the west. Here is the new Cherry Street Bridge on the north end already in position. And you can see a little bit of the new Cherry Street being constructed here. This is the old Cherry Street and this bridge will be demolished. And as we're traveling towards the east, you'll see then over here on the right, when the river is constructed, this will be an island and unlocked for redevelopment once the flood protection is created. This is under the Villiers Island Precinct Plan. We're continuing to travel east along the Keating Channel. There's many heritage buildings along the, uh, the south side here. This is Villiers Street. And you'll see the gardener here. And up to the north then, this is the Don River as it comes down, angles into Keating Channel and beside the Don a river there will be a sediment and debris management area. The Don River is getting widened and deepened uh, so there will be sediment uh, deposition here and on um, dredging, operational dredging occurring. We're going to turn um, 90 degrees south as the Don River will be extending to the, the south here. There first up is the ice management area. There's a, an aggregate armored uh, shelf to prevent some of the, the scouring the first half in this picture of the Commissioner Street Bridge has been put in position. Right now, the second half is already in position and welded. That's the alignment of Commissioner Street. And you'll see many of the stockpiles here, again, reading for reuse within the, the Portlands area. And then the, ma the main river channel here, as you see that, that uh, meandering out into the Pulse and Slip in the Inner Harbor. Just another look at this section of the river valley and some of these specialized finishes and slopes that are being constructed. And that's pictures of those harvested trees. We'll look at a little bit more closely later and at later and some of the lifts uh, that are created to the slopes. There's that fire hall heritage feature that's been moved to the south to make way for Commissioner Street and um, pedestrian uh, bridge that's coming up here. There's the foundations that are in place as well. And then the, the last bridge still to come down to the site is up ahead of us here. There's the foundations on the left and right for Cherry Street Bridge South. You can see Cherry Street here. It'll be shifted over to the, the west. And there we are back again to that heritage feature of Atlas Crane. Hey, I'm standing on the Don Roadway a little further south from where we were before, or at least this is the former Don Roadway. And let's go back in time, back to 2015 and step through the planning process we had for the project on soil management needs. We started with the soil management plan that set the stage for a number of things, including soil tracking requirements, importing, exporting and reuse criteria. 
testing processes, inspection and excavation procedures, environmental protection, documentation, stockpiles, contingency planning, and complaint processes. There was a lot packed in that SMP and had to cover a great deal for this project. The SMP was part of a larger um, community-based risk assessment. And as the MECP moved through their regulatory development process, they, along with our other regulatory bodies and stakeholders, provided comments on the SMP. It took several drafts, several years, and about a half dozen workshops with representatives from the MECP, Environment Canada, TRCA, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, City of Toronto, Ports Toronto, DFO, MNRF, um, all of those to, to get input and finalize the SMP. I remember one meeting filling the double boardroom at Waterfront Toronto with standing room only, a testament to how much interest there was on this SMP and the soil management processes. When the proposed regulatory framework and draft regulation came out, like you, Waterfront Toronto had questions. Is the flood protection an infrastructure project? No. Um, aren't all our projects infrastructure projects? No. So it became clear in this timeline, based on the MECP draft regulatory process for excess soil, that the project needed an instrument. But what would that be? Um, at the MECP's direction, they guided us to Section 10 of the EPA. And that's the program approval, where it says the director may issue a program approval directed to the person who submitted the program. And the SMP here was the program. It was finalized, as I said, in uh, July 2019, and then it approved with the program approval later in the fall. The program approval covers the soil management within the project area, the flood protection project, so we are good to go. Let's just look th back through that whole process here with the soil management plan starting in 2015, the draft, working through several drafts with the final version in 2019. All the while, the MECP was working through their framework for the regulation with the excess soil management policy framework in 2016, the draft regulatory proposal in 2017, 2018, and then finally the excess soil regulation in 2019 promulgated in December of 2019. Uh, and alongside that, we had our detailed design running through. So the soil management design from 30, 60, 90, 100% to issue for tender, to issue for construction, so the construction could start in 2019. And as you look and see these side by side, you can see the real strong need to integrate where the ministry was going to with their access soil regulation and integrate those needs in the soil management plan and the detailed design. Okay, confession time. These videos were taken over a couple of days the week before the excess soil symposium, so you're gonna see a lot of weather changes. The first soil importation project here, or at least um, this century, was over at the Cherry Street Lake Filling Project. This was before the soil management plan finalization, because this project was in 2017 to 2019. So 250,000 cubic meters of soil was brought in, about 350 truckloads of soil per day between, again, 2017 and 2019 to create new land, to improve habitat and provide space for a new road. Right now, the current Cherry Street Bridge creates a narrow point in the channel of the Keating Channel. In the event of a major storm, that channel will likely get overwhelmed and flood. Realigning Cherry Street and rebuilding the Cherry Street Bridge will help storm water more easily flow through the Keating Channel. Yep, so now this type of project has an exemption from the regulation, that final placement of excess soil on the bed of a surface water body. You're right, but let's peek at where the soil came from. There we go. So it, was, it came from the Bathurst and Bloor former Honest Eds project, and also came from the former Globe and Mail facility at Front and Spadina. Those two projects served as the source of the soil. These are project areas under the regulation and would need to comply with the excess soil regulation. Another benefit, and one of the key intended benefits of the excess soil regulation is the sustainability and reduction in greenhouse gases from reusing soil within seven kilometers of the project area. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so we're now on the north side, just north of the Lakeville site. We walked across the new Cherry Street Bridge to get there. It was a lovely wintry Monday last week. And here is the video. 
Okay, you can see the CN Tower in the background just to give you that perspective of where we are. And we're looking at the Lakeville site. And you can see the foundations of the bridge on the left side. That's uh, the new section of the Cherry Street Bridge. And then we're going to zoom in a little bit closer, have a look at that dock wall. So the lake filling site is uh, before the excess soil regulations. In a retrospective review that Waterfront Toronto did to look at the readiness for the regulation, they looked at Cherry Street Lake filling as one of the example projects to see how ready Waterfront Toronto was for the regulation. And for the most part, the processes met the or exceeded the bar. The lake filling was approved through an environmental assessment and a DFO permit, so those are legal instruments. The planning documents were completed for the project area. A fill management plan was developed for the reuse area. Excavation and truck observations and those processes were in place. Soil tracking was completed and an auditing process was uh, um, implemented as well. The only missing part that would be required was the, and required January 1, 2022, is the registration of the project areas, the source of the soil on the registry. So let's learn a little bit more about Cherry Street Lake Filling Project from some videos taken a while back. Okay, here we've got a time lapse of the lake filling of the Cherry Street Lake Filling Project. The video is taken from the silo that's on the Ezra Key. Ezra Key is the land that you're seeing in front, one of the many keys that's down in the Portlands. Keating Channel is on the right. Right now, that is the main channel and outlet of the Don River into the Inner Harbour. And on the left is another slip. The lake filling area, you can see the revetment that's being constructed now. I remember back in late 2017, the very first load of armor stone that was delivered by barge through the Welland Canal and then deposited to form the revetment. And it was after many, many barge loads later that that revetment emerged out of the water. You're starting to see the lake filling process and uh, at some points you can see some of the, the truckloads coming in and, and depositing. So the lake filling was all done by by truck uh, deposits in behind the revetment. Once the revetment was in place, then the confined um, filling could proceed. There, that was uh, some examples there that you saw of some of the the truckloads bringing in soil from the former Globe and Mail facility. On the right, you're seeing the formation of the Cherry Street Bridge abutments um, on the the lower right, and in the future, this land will be a park, promontory park, set, uh, north and a roadway and a network of roads through here and a redevelopment property on the left side too. So now we're looking at a drone survey moving away from downtown, give you a visual overview of the lake filling project after it was complete in 2019. Here's a video of Cherry Street North Bridge. It came in all the way from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, down through the St. Lawrence Seaway, came in very early in the morning. I remember being down there at sunrise to get some pictures of this lovely new bridge. This is the first bridge for the, the Portlands. And did you see on that barge how it spun around and then was installed on the bridge abutments? That's Keating Channel. You'll see that off to the east here is the current alignment of Cherry Street. And then the bridge is showing the future alignment of Cherry Street. So Cherry Street will end up going straight north and connecting up with Cherry Street towards the north. Okay, who knew that the application of engineered soil mixtures could cause such controversy? Is it soil? Is it a product? So using the soil rules to what really is soil, being pragmatic and not including some of those non-soil surfacing, wood fibers, biochar, seaweed, mixtures, engineered fiber matrix, or other planting products, that's really important. So have a have a look at that in your projects and, and look at and determine what soil and what's not soil. I think that really can help you in your way forward. We had some of those uh, issues at Cherry Street Lake Filling Project and things to work through to make sure things were covered appropriately. The Cherry Street Lake Filling Project had five qualified persons, environmental consultants. Um, the project area owners QP, the project area contractors QP, the reuse site contractors QP, the reuse site owners QP, and the city's peer reviewer QP. Um, that's a lot of QPs. What happens when you have seven QPs? Um, well, welcome to the Portlands River Valley excavation. We're going to go there next. 
Once the Cherry Street lay filling project was substantially complete, then the, the excavation of 1.4 million cubic meters of soil from the river valley could begin. The soil management program placed heavy emphasis on beneficial reuse to find an on-site solution to the excavated soil on one hand, and then soil demand for the grade changes for flood protection, future redevelopment, rehabilitation, parkland landscaping, and those topograph um, topography changes on the other. So that is a cut fill calculation. The cut fill calculation was completed at the conceptual design stage in 2015 and continues to be updated and tracked to this day. Now that cut fill balance is enhanced with monthly drone volume surveys and measurements by Alice Dawn. In addition to the on-site reuse, more soil has to or will be imported to fill several needs. Either the cut fill from the River Valley excavation didn't align um, time-wise with when the soil was needed or it's just specialty soil that needs to be imported. So imported soil fills a wide variety of project needs, including geotechnical improvement, um, the surcharging that's being done to compress some of those organic soils and the geotechnically poor soils, or there is uh, flood protection, grade changes, green infrastructure, planting soils, river slope construction, landscaping, and many other beneficial reuses. So far, there have been three project areas providing soil to the project, other than the two for the Cherry Street Lake Filling Project. And for each one, regardless of whether it's required by the Excess Soil Regulation, uh, have completed the planning document, so the source site assessment and soil characterization reports. And building a sensitive landscape requires that heightened scrutiny on soil quality. So if a due diligence approach was considered, the project at QPs would look at the framework of the SMP to make sure it's consistent with the SMP. So how are all these requirements put into force during construction? Well, let's look at that next. There are a series of specifications that translate the requirements of the SMP into contract language. Here you'll see a list of some of the specifications, soil management, soil tracking, excavation, stockpiling, imported soil, and sediment management. And there are also some supplemental environmental protection plans, and these are essential on the project and are under the umbrella of Waterfront Toronto's environmental management plan. They include air, dust, odor, noise, vibration, surface water, stormwater management, and so on. On the video on the left playing now, you'll see that every stockpile is identified and tagged. And that's a really important aspect on a project of this size. Automated systems and processes are key, as well as having a regular audit, oversight, and review process. They are all, they are all necessary to verify compliance. In the next slide up, we'll be looking more closely at one of the processes that is used as an auditing tool. Here's a demo of one of the soil tracking systems used on the project. We're going to look at a single hour a week ago, the soil tracking system itemizing and tracking every truckload of material moved within the project. Using GPS enabled equipment and GPS grids and nodes, the movement of soil from its pickup to drop off location can be viewed, essentially real time. And you're seeing here that an hour, single hour last week is being picked. Soil tracking has advanced phenomenally in the last few years and the days of paper bay waybills should be mostly behind us. There are several soil tracking systems that are in use on this project or have been used in the past and there's a place for each style of soil tracking system. You're seeing here all the variety of material that was moved in that single hour last week, not just soil but other aggregates as well. And we're going to focus in on one example to see how that material was moved from its pickup location to its drop off location. So here it is, the path of its pickup to its drop off. More and more municipalities are evaluating the responsibilities as a project leader in having a soil tracking system. Waterfront Toronto's approach was to not specify the soil tracking system, but to specify the mandatory requirements of the system. Before soil is placed at its final destination, the process in place on this project is for the owner's QP to review the soil quality and soil documentation and approve the placement prior to placement. The soil quality data and approval system is in a separate Equus database. Each stockpile is tested in accordance with the regulatory sampling test frequency. We're looking at the north section of the river at a cutoff wall at the north end. It's referred to as the north plug and it'll be cut down to at the very end of the project to connect the river channel with the upgrading of Don River. You're looking towards the ice management area where armoring will be put in place to protect from scouring and off in the distance are some stockpiles and regrading that's being done as part of flood protection. And here's the Commissioner Street Bridge that are connected in place. There's some super stacks there that are containing activated carbon that are being used for some of the environmental control measures. There's about 
400,000 meters cubed of soil left to be excavated from the river valley. So a million has already been excavated and repurposed. Some soil has gone off site for disposal and some soil has been treated on site under mobile or permanent environmental compliance approvals. And some soil is in stockpiles pending reuse. Even on the wintry day of my site visit, there were over 20 different individual soil or fill moving projects underway. We're just south of the previous stop, south of the Commissioner Street Bridge, and we'll see some of the excavation that's underway here. This is in the area that's affectionately known as the elbow. It uh, elbows through and turns to the main channel that then discharges out into the inner harbor. You'll see off in the distance some of the stockpiling that's being done and some of the excavation that's in River Park North where there's some surcharging for geotechnical improvement. And we're looking now south towards the Greenway and the shipping channel and then back up towards that main channel towards the, the west. We love our bridges. Here's the Commissioner Street Bridge going into place. This was back in August and the second half of the Commissioner Street Bridge is already in place and welded in. You'll note that this bridge is orange, Cherry Street North Bridge is red, Cherry Street South Bridge is yellow. And that is to represent the sun at different times in the day from sunrise to sunset. We're looking south towards the shipping channel with this, one of the stormwater management ponds on the right side here and the shipping channel off in the distance. And this is the Greenway. This is directly in line with the Don River and it'll be activated in significant storm events when the floodwaters and overtop and discharge into the shipping channel. You'll see here the geomembrane that is being in place as one of the environmental control measures on the project. To coordinate the roles and responsibilities, Waterfront Toronto had a series of QP sessions with all the environmental consulting firms involved in contract administration so that there was a harmonization on approach and concurrence on process. For each type of soil movement, the approval authority for soil placement prior to placement was identified in order to provide clear direction in site decisions and to establish accountability records. We're in the main river channel looking towards the east. This is the fire hall on the north side. It's been relocated to the south to make way for Commissioner Street. This is going to be River Park North on the north side here. Much of the grade changes have already been uh, completed. There is still some surcharging material for that geotechnical soil improvement. Now we're looking towards the west in the main river channel and you can see the fiber encapsulated lifts on the side there as well as the the wood that is reinforcing the side slopes and then the center levee core wetlands off in the distance and the soil management area in the distance as well and as we come back now we're looking east towards the uh, upgrading river let's zoom in on these side slopes Imported soil was used to build fiber encapsulated lifts. The side slopes of the river have to withstand high flowing water in some sections. And inside is soil and plant seeds. The soil is imported to site and mixed with seeds and wrapped with fabric to keep it in place. They're, they are built in seven lifts with one estimate being a total of 11 kilometers in length that they are individually placed end to end. And once the plants establish the roots, the fabric will biodegrade and the roots will keep the riverbank from eroding. Looking west across the future Promontory Park South, there's a few activities we can see here. There's preparations for the Cherry Street Bridge South arrival. And in the background, there's excavation of Canoe Cove right by the Atlas Crane. Canoe Cove will be part of a, the Promontory Park South. It'll be a shallow water feature. The water that you see in front of you was land. Last spring, it was excavated to meet up to the West Plug. And when the West Plug is removed, then that waterway will be connected with the Don River. I'm standing in front of Waterfront Toronto's panel board showing some of the artifacts that were found during the excavation. And it's a really exciting day down here with the Cherry Street South Bridge being moved. That's why it's so loud right at this location. I'm actually looking at the Cherry Street South Bridge and have been already told they have to move within the hour. And I just met one of the artists, the photographer, who's been taking the, the pictures of the Portlands project, took the pictures in the background, and has an artist installation along Villiers Street of the progress of the project. 
and let me know that there's another installation coming in the spring so do check it out but I wanted to talk about soil I wanted to talk about monitoring soil circumstances different than intended has there ever been an excavation that doesn't have surprises the excess soil regulation requires a project leader to develop excavation procedures and processes to monitor for unforeseen circumstances and the Portland project is no different there are procedures and roles and responsibilities developed in the SNP and expanded upon through technical memos and site instructions. The on-site team looks for visual signs of oil, debris and contamination and they have a process flow and chain of command when issues are identified. We like to think that environmental conditions are the only factor at play, the most important, but geotechnical, horticultural and environmental make up the triad of specifications on many projects. The reality is that environmental quality standards are often missed in imported soil specifications and there's some catch up to do. Waterfront Toronto updated um, their specifications to address environmental, geotechnical and horticultural needs. Waterfront Toronto's director Steve Desroches notes that meeting horticultural quality requirements for salt related compounds, electrical conductivity and sodium absorption ratio is sometimes more of a challenge than meeting environmental quality standards. Go big. Sometimes excavation finds are historically significant. Here's this little specimen that grew out of the 100 year wetland soil when the overlying two to three meters of overburdened soil was excavated and the peat was exposed to sunlight. It's a scientifically, ecologically, and historically amazing find of a viable historic seed bank. Waterfront Toronto documented and preserved this unique seed bank, and hopefully we'll see these plants flourishing in future wetlands. There's a team on site that looks for artifacts like this. Toronto Region Conservation Authority and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation are monitoring the excavation in the new river valley to identify documents and document items that may be historical or cultural significance. The government breakwater from the late 1800s that's shown in the panel behind me was expected to be found in the western edge of the main channel. And once it was uncovered, the condition was impressive. Excavation in the area stopped for about a week to document the find. My artifact is a royal salad dressing bottle from 1882 and it was sold recently at auction for $375. I'm keeping mine. We're at our last stop of the tour and we're looking towards the future sediment and debris management area in the picture on the left. We are just west of the Don Roadway and north of Lakeshore Boulevard, just at actually the Don River intersection. During the flood protection project, the sediment in the Don River will be dredged to widen and deepen for flood conveyance. The sediment quality has been investigated for quite some time and has shown a continual improvement in quality. And a thorough sediment sampling investigation was completed this year to verify the reuse options and to finalize specifications and project plans. The result was good news. Most sediment from this area historically has gone to a facility in Leslie Street Spit. So instead of unnecessarily reducing the capacity of, of that facility, the sediment can be reused within this project. Long term though, the change in the Don River here is to enhance the sediment bed load deposition in the area and minimize deposition further downstream in the new naturalized river valley. So that means there will be an ongoing dredging operation. Not many municipalities in Ontario have regular dredging programs, but where they do, the programs come face to face with the excess soil regulation. For this project area, a waste ECA is not expected to be required for the stockpiling activities in the project area, but the regulations kick in for sediment storage and reuse and reuse outside the project area. And as always, environmental protection and mitigating adverse effects are mandatory. Waterfront Toronto and their QPs through this whole project have been able to find solutions and make decisions on the complex Portland's soil and sediment management programs. I'm here over the Don River on a pedestrian bike bridge and I'm just north of the foot of the Don. Getting ready for an upcoming regulation at the same time as completing detailed design and starting construction for a highly visible project meant understanding deeply the intent of the regulation at the early stages in the framework to the draft to the final stages. 
The project required, as I've noted, regular contact with the MECP for input on application of the regulation. I know many entities are undertaking similar readiness assessments and establishing qualified teams. And like you, Waterfront Toronto completed internal training. They compared previous projects to the new regulatory requirements. They identified the, the gaps and addressed those gaps with agreements, updated specifications and plans, and they continue to look closely at each project and the XSO regulatory requirements. Collectively, there is a wealth of information and knowledge amongst the attendees today and participants in the panel discussion and the regulatory brain trust here. I know and I've seen that as an excess soul community, we'll work together, share information and champion implementation of the excess soul regulation. And I look forward to continued collaborations. I'll leave you with images here demonstrating the benefits of beneficial soil reuse. This is a video filmed this year by Toronto and Region Conservation Authority of the West Cove and Cherry Street Lake Filling Project. Before this area was part of the water lot before the lake filling and in a habitat assessment back then was declared poor and degraded with the creation of new land through the beneficial reuse of soil. Now there's a healthy thriving number of fish in a relatively small cove just two short years after its construction. Salvage trees are submerged at the base, anchored in with stone, creating the foundations for what is quickly becoming a healthy aquatic ecosystem. Working together, the possibilities of new landforms, habitat and land restoration from beneficial soil reuse are real. Thank you, Actual Media, for hosting the 5th Excess Soil Symposium. Are we ready? There is a diverse group of panel discussions coming up, so enjoy the information exchange and please make sure to contribute your thoughts on excess soil through this platform. Thanks for joining me today on the Portland's Flood Protection Soil Tour. Megan James, signing off. Thank you so much, Megan, for putting this detailed presentation together. I know that was a lot of work, uh, very worthwhile, so much unique insight. Thank you again. So our next session, how new regulations impact the industry, will be starting at 1145. So that's just about three minutes away. You can access that by clicking on the session title in your agenda. Thank you again, and we'll see you in just a few moments.